The Thousand Sons in 40k are servants of the chaos-powered Zinch, a legion of sorcerers and their thralls on a quest for the darkest knowledge. But it's a fate that took them a long time to accept, for the Thousand Sons were once idealists, a legion dedicated to saving the Imperium in many ways from itself. Hiya, welcome to Heresy 101. In this little series, I'm going through the lore for each of Warhammer's Space Marine legions, particularly their origin in the grim days of the Horus Heresy. In this, I take a look at where they are at the start of the Heresy and how they got there, and then what happens to them during it. Anyway, before I start, this series does contain spoilers, particularly for the Horus Heresy Black Library novels, but also for many of the rule books. The Thousand Sons were the first great casualty of the Horus Heresy, betrayed by both the Loyalists and by Horus himself. But they weren't without fault, and the arrogance of their Primarch and their casual dismissal of the Emperor's laws had provided Horus with all the excuse he needed to remove them from the board. The history of the 15th Legion starts slightly later than many of their brother legions, and their genesis came at a strange and ill-omened time for the Imperium. The fires of unification had been burning across Terra for generations, and the nascent Imperium was starting to take the first steps towards the conquest of the solar system, and following that, the Great Crusade, but the warp storms that had cut humanity off throughout the Age of Strife had briefly flared up again. And with this crusade on temporary hold, the Emperor turned his hand to the 15th Legion, selecting many of their initial recruits personally. These were taken from some of the most loyal, educated, and civilized areas of Terra. In many cases, individually selected, and the gene seed they were implanted with had a very low rejection rate. And so when the initial implantation process went particularly well and a thousand new Astartes stood arrayed in front of him, the 15th Legion earned their name particularly early when the Emperor dubbed them his Thousand Sons. The new Legion took this to heart, keeping the name well after they'd grown past the thousand and adopting the M glyph as their symbol. As the Crusade started, they fought their first engagements, but aside from their slow and careful selection process, they initially displayed no particular specialization. Crusade Command assigned them to missions much like any of the other legions. It was a few decades into the Crusade that the Legion openly started to exhibit psychic powers in battle. First a few and then a majority of the Legion exhibiting some form of psychic talent. For many this made sense and they praised the Emperor's foresight, the slow careful recruitment, the personal selection, of course this was the Emperor's plan. But psychers as a whole were not trusted, generally believed to be the cause of Old Night and a risk that could damn whole worlds, many considered the idea of a psychic legion an extreme risk. Horus himself, the only Primarch discovered by this point, voiced his concerns, but the Emperor wouldn't comment, and while they were often distrusted, with some of the early legions refusing to serve alongside them, they were also effective, on occasion even being led by the Emperor himself when he had to face specific Xenos threats. It was on Byzant though that people's suspicions started to become justified. The Byzantine had resisted compliance and the imperial truth, preferring to remain in the service of their gods and priests. The 15th were deployed against a human population who harnessed the power of the warp more potently than any yet encountered, and as they fought each other, the Thousand Sons poured more and more of their psychic talent into the fray. The build-up of warp power was immense, like nothing the Imperium had seen before, and at the height of the battle, something snapped. A single warrior of the Thousand Sons fell. The substance of the warrior's body slowly blew apart. Slick flows of malleable flesh spilled from his broken armor, bone fused with the sustenance of his war gear, and his blood misted and congealed into new forms in the air all the while as the nameless warrior screamed for mercy in a thousand silent voices heard in every mind of his legion. His brothers killed him then, and the event was hushed up seen as an aberration due to the warp-tainted nature of the battle, but over time it started happening more and more. It was dubbed the Flesh Change, and as the years went on it spread through the Legion, affecting first a few Legionaries, and then hundreds at a time. Though the Thousand Sons attempted to keep it secret, 
it was obvious to the Imperium that something was very wrong, some fault in the genetics or cellular degradation, and for many this was evidence that the Legion should never have been created in the first place. The Sons themselves tried everything they could to halt it as their numbers started to dwindle. Medical solutions, psychic solutions, training and strength of mind, but none worked. Eventually they began to entomb warriors who started to show signs of the change in stasis vaults deep within their fleets in the hope of one day finding a cure. So while they continued to fight and the psychic might of the survivors grew and grew, there were calls from across the crusade for the Legion to be disbanded a failed experiment that shamed the Imperium the longer it kept running. But the Emperor said nothing, for the Crusade had neared the planet of Prospero. The 5,000 years of old night, the age of strife where warp storms divided and isolated humanity, happened alongside another strange occurrence an increase in psychic potential in humans. This was the end of many worlds. Stranded and alone, their societies couldn't cope with the sudden emergence of powerful psychers whose untrained minds became portals for the strange creatures that inhabited the warp. But on Prospero, that story had a slightly different ending. Prospero, before Old Night descended, was a haven of civilization and enlightenment, with a huge and well-organized population whose cities covered every environment on the planet. When the Psychers emerged, many of those cities were destroyed and the population was decimated, but the survivors hung on, studying and adapting to their new abilities, and it was this that brought on a second calamity. A plague of Psychonoian. The Psychonoian are nightmarish predatory creatures who live both within the warp and in reality. Drawn to individuals of psychic potential, their reproductive cycle requires their eggs to be gestated within the mind of a living psyche in our reality. In the psychic blossoming of Prospero's people, the Psychonoian had found the perfect nest. The survivors, overwhelmed by the swarm of warp creatures, fortified themselves within the final and greatest city of Prospero, Tizca, a city of great glass pyramids and protected by shimmering force domes. The rest of the planet was left to the invader. But over time, the citizens prospered in their isolation, developing ways of controlling their newfound powers, refining them, and all the while, keeping the barriers of the city well defended against alien encroachment. It was into this that the 15th Primarch landed. The Primarchs were created by the Emperor as the genetic templates for the 20 Legiones Astartes, but during the Unification Wars they'd been scattered across the galaxy. The 15th capsule landed in Tizca, with a red-skinned infant unharmed at its centre, and the citizens adopted him as an omen. Over time, the child, named Magnus and known as Magnus the Red, came to dominate Prosperine life. He learned from some of the greatest tutors of the age before surpassing them and becoming the master, ascending through the governmental circles until he was de facto ruler of the planet and leading a campaign to purge the planet of the Psychonoian. He was an enigmatic and charismatic figure, a red giant of a man, possessed of a colossal intellect and incredible psychic power, devoted to unlocking the secrets of what Prosperine scholars termed the Great Ocean but also completely convinced of his own methods and the righteousness of his path. His psychic powers were such that he claimed to have spoken to his father across the stars, though if that's true or an exaggeration, or if he was actually speaking to the Emperor at all, is open to interpretation. Either way, when the Imperium arrived, the Emperor knew enough to bring the remnants of the Thousand Sons with him. The bond between a Primarch and his gene sons is said to transcend even that between parent and child. Between beings such as Magnus and his psychically attuned sons, the bond seems to have been closer still. For from the moment they were reunited, both Primarch and Legion seemed extensions of each other in thought, outlook, and spirit. Magnus devoted himself to finding a cure for the flesh change. In fact, it was said that the Emperor set that as his first task. And he turned all the knowledge of Prospero to the solution and delved far, possibly too far, into the esoteric arts. But eventually, it worked, though none other than Magnus could explain how. And when he emerged from this work, his newfound knowledge had cost him an eye. But whatever he found out there, whatever obscure knowledge or warp power he was able to harness, his first act had been to save his legion, by this point reduced once again to just a thousand warriors, and so from there they began to rebuild. 
The new legion adopted many of the teachings of Prospero. The esoteric orders and schools of study, the five prospering arcane cults, and the two cultures meshed well. The new 15th were a legion of warrior scholars, fighting compliance actions across the galaxy, not just to acquire territory or unify humanity, but to search for lost knowledge. Their Primarch was an idealist, and like his legion, he believed that no knowledge or learning should be sequestered or hidden, and that any truth, any power in the galaxy could be mastered. But Magnus and his Thousand Sons never escaped the suspicions of the Imperium. Their forces would often change plans or directions seemingly on a whim, leaving war zones suddenly or arriving at new ones without warning based on where the quest for knowledge took them, an unreliable trait in an ally. And while their Primarch was charismatic and personable and had more than a few good friends amongst his brothers, he could also be confident to the point of arrogance. This suspicion came to a head with the Librarius Project, devised by Magnus alongside his brothers Sanguinius and Jagatai Khan as a way to safely incorporate the use of psychic power across the legions. The Librarius was adopted and tested by most of the legions over the course of the Crusade, but it always had its detractors, Primarchs who wouldn't suffer their legions to be, as they saw it, polluted by Magnus's ambition. Sanguinius and the Khan pushed for caution for the slow and steady growth of the project, but Magnus wouldn't be convinced, pushing further and further, and when the debate came to a head during the Council of Nicaea, he pushed for fewer restrictions, for even greater use of psychers. Eventually, the Emperor, silent for all these years on the subject, decreed his experiment over. The use of psychic powers within the legions was banned, but that decree would be tested as soon as the Horus Heresy broke out. At the end of the Great Crusade, the Thousand Sons numbered around 80 to 85,000 legionnaires, making them one of the smallest legions. And these were organized into nine fellowships, and from there broken down into the company sized formations known as circles, and then into individual squads. The Legion made use of all the standard squad formations and equipment of war that any other Legion had, from tactical and assault squads to armoured support and line breaker companies. And at the squad level, they were pretty similar to any other Legion. While the Legion contained vastly more psychers than any other, they were no means all psychers, and the majority of the line Legionnaires either exhibited no psychic ability or a very limited ability honed by the teachings of Prospero. However, above the squad level, the Legion was pretty unique. Most of the command staff were gifted psychers, though there were exceptions, and organized into almost indecipherable patterns of ranks that had occult significance to Magnus. The circles themselves were similarly organized and could vary in size depending on their place within the mysteries of the Legion. The Circle of Iad 9, for example, consisted of 512 warriors divided into squads kept at strengths of either 16, 9, or 7. And it was often the case that squad strengths or Legion numerical designations would have this sort of occult numerology attached. The Legion had used Prospero as their base since its discovery, and they were mostly stationed there when the heresy started, which was to prove fatal in the war's opening years. When the Warmaster Horus was wounded by a ritual dagger, part of a scheme by the word bearers to lure him to the side of chaos, and he lay dying in the Serpent Lodge on Davin, he experienced his first visions of the powers of chaos. Magnus was half a galaxy away, but he'd seen the threads of fate converging and attempted to save his brother, pushing his way into Horus's fevered dreams. But when it became clear that Horus was going to fall and nothing Magnus could do would stop that, he changed course. Breaking with the Treaty of Nicaea, he and his legion attempted to warn the Emperor, projecting his astral self directly into the Emperor's laboratory on terror. But this warning was lost as the surge of psychic power played havoc with the Emperor's own secret project to harness the power of the webway. The great seals around the project were destroyed and the power of the warp threatened to spill over and consume the Imperial dungeon and then terror itself, forcing the Emperor, the Custodes and the Sisters of Silence to fight a long and costly rearguard action against a tide of demons in the webway. The Emperor was furious at what he saw as another arrow arrogant demonstration of Magnus's power and decreed that the Space Wolves Legion, led by Liman Rus, be dispatched to Prospero to bring Magnus and the Thousand Sons back in chains. 
but the emperor couldn't deliver this decree himself. He had a lot on his plate suddenly. This decree was delivered through the war master, Horus, at that point well on the way to planning his betrayal, and he twisted those words, delivering orders to Rus to destroy the 15th and their errant Primarch. And so for the Thousand Sons, their story during the heresy starts and almost ends with the first great battle, the burning of Prospero. At first, Magnus refused to fight, and his legion stood arrayed on the plains outside the city, but as the wolves descended and it became clear that surrender was not an option, the Thousand Sons fought back, and waves of psychic fire halted the advance of the Sixth. It was only when the Sisters of Silence and the warriors of the Legio Custodes were deployed that the wolves managed to press the advantage and, denied of their psychic powers by the Witch Seeker squads of the Sisterhood, outnumbered and with little in the way of prepared defences, the Thousand Sons started to lose. Eventually, as the battle neared its end, Magnus finally decided to aid his sons and fought Rus in single combat, where Leman Rus broke his brother's back across his knee. But Magnus was as much made of the power of the warp as he was a physical entity, and his consciousness survived, broken into a series of astral shards, and his last great spell was, once again, an attempt to save his legion, opening a warp gate and teleporting the final few survivors and part of Tizka itself far away into the Eye of Terror as the city burned. Once again, the 15th had been reduced to just a thousand warriors, deprived of their Primarch and stranded in warp space, and once again they started to rebuild. For the rest of the heresy, they were a rare sight, a shattered collection of squads and circles who either missed the muster at Prospero to begin with, or had sallied out from their new homeworld of Sorotarius in an attempt to locate the shards of their Primarch and reassemble his consciousness. Magnus would stand once more alongside his brothers as the Thousand Sons, with few options left and slowly realising the cost of their actions, threw in their lot with the Warmaster. They were present at the Siege of Terror, but only in small numbers, and devoted themselves to bringing down the psychic wards around the palace, and strengthening Horus's advance with the aid of their new allies in the warp. And that's the 15th Legion, a legion many might say were treated as a shady experiment right from the start, a test devised by the Emperor and discarded towards the end of the Crusade. Their own quest for enlightenment made them idealists, but those ideals were a hard sell to the rest of the Imperium, and their own self-righteousness in the face of criticism didn't help. In the end, they were betrayed, first by the Imperium they served, and then again as the full reality of the Chaos powers and the bargains Magnus had struck with them became known. And that's where we find them in 40k, a legion of sorcerers still operating from that planet in the Eye of Terror, and still resigned to their fate as pawns of Zinch. Thanks for watching. Okay, so if you'd like more heresy info or even more of these, then click on that thing right there to the right. The next Legion's probably coming up. And if you'd like to support the channel in any way or see these videos a bit earlier, then there's a Patreon link in the thing below. See ya.